Streaming live from Treaty 1 territory in the heartland of the Métis Nation, the place where the great waterways meet and the heart of Turtle Island. We have guests from the territory of Toronto, which is grounded in the Treaty of a Dish with One Spoon and is home to some of the most diverse population in Canada. We also have a guest from the other side of the planet, Aratoa, New Zealand. I want to welcome everybody to the event and give thanks to our partners at South by Southwest and Canada House for their support to making this panel possible. I am your host, uh, Julie Negum, and I'm an Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Arts, Collaboration and Digital Media. I'm the Director of the newly created Abijibawan New Media Lab and a practicing digital media artist. In addition, I'm also the artistic director for Nui Blanche Toronto, which is the largest public exhibition in North America. I'm super excited today to host this panel, The Digital Decolonized with Imaginative and South by Southwest. The focus of this dialogue is to reflect on the innovation of digital landscape. We as Indigenous creatives around the world are developing unique multimodal works, and at the core of these interventions are Indigenous perspectives, supported by frameworks and protocols for interpreting language, culture, and traditions in exciting and new ways. In this 60 minutes, we'll grapple with the intersections of culture, technology, and creativity, as well as a reflection on contemporary industries through an Indigenous lens. In 2020 and 2021, we are left with contemplating the huge shifts into the virtual realm, as we are relegated to stay in our cozy, localized spaces and not get to travel. Tonight, our guests have extensive knowledge in digital media and artistic creation, and our conversation is going to be fascinating, exciting to reflect on the new age of media and immersive technologies to tell our stories and new narratives. To First, we're going to get the panel panelists to introduce themselves and their practice, and uh, let's begin. There's a few people that are situated in my territory, but I'm going to select Casey to start. Hi, my name is Casey Koizan. I'm a Tlicho Dene interdisciplinary artist, originally from Yellowknife Northwest Territories, now living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where I'm navigating my way through um, my last semester of a Master of Fine Arts degree at the University of Manitoba. Um, some of the stuff that I work in is large scale installation, sculpture, 3D and VR um, work, uh, modeling, a little bit of animation. And I'm currently uh, the project lead on a VR experience and video game titled Wanaze Keoke Sea Visions, which is all about um, experiencing the legends, myths, and stories of uh, the Northwest Territories in this kind of dreamlike shamanistic state. Awesome. Thanks, Casey. Asha, would you like to go next? So Asha, greetings all, and thank you, you are well. My name is Asha. I'm a creative technologist working at the intersection of virtual reality, data sovereignty, and business. I'm also an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians, Wolf Clan. Awesome. Moni, can we hear from you? Sure. Sayako, you're going to greet Celeste Young I am Moni Gar. I'm located in the Akwesasne Indian Reservation. I sit with the Bear Clan and I'm the founder of uh, monigar.com and we produce XR experiences. Um, one of the our current projects is mohawklanguage.ca and that's all I have to say. <laughs> we'll get into it in a little bit. Santo, can we hear from you, please? Yeah, of course. So, my name is Santo. I'm originally from Paraguay with uh, my Guarani family, and now I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I'm currently a game developer specializing in creating games around expressions of indigeneity, Guarani spirituality. And currently, I'm focusing on uh, representations of indigenous cyberpunk and working on an unannounced project exploring. Uh, venues of Guarani futurism and cyberpunk and uh, sci-fi as well. Uh, kia ora everyone, my name is um, Talai Fulka. Uh, I created Omorangi Generation, which was a video game um, that was released on PC last year and is coming to Switch this year. Um, my uh, iwi is Naitarangi and my hapu is uh, Tukarangi. And yeah, I, I got invited on here, but I can't help but notice that the um, Zoom meeting on my end sort of followed a yarning circle as we're going through. and. It sort of makes me think of it because like when I was working at a university a few years ago, one of the things we tried to do was um, teach classes in circle. And one of the ideas we had was actually creating a circle online. And we actually found that worked better for online teaching because in a digital space, when everyone gets a turn, everyone has to stay engaged, but also um, 
it sort of helps keeping like the the sort of class alive beyond sort of the keyboard if that makes sense um so i, I don't know it's, it's really interesting how that stuff works out um but yeah i'm really happy to be here and thank you for inviting me uh, we're really we're really thrilled to have you and i'd say one of the benefits of uh the global pandemic is that we get to connect virtually all over the all over the planet and so i think that that's one of the positive things I'd say that um, I was hoping that each of you would talk a little bit about what brought you to digital media. And so I thought maybe we could start there and you could reflect a little bit on your practice, but you know, what were some of the driving factors? And, and like Tally said, you know, maybe we'll just take turns each rotating out, making sure everybody's voice is heard. Casey, do you wanna go? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, so I've, uh, ever since I was a kid, I've always been inspired by, by sci-fi and, you know, futuristic realms and that sort of thing. Um, leading more into my practice when starting to do art, it was always kind of there, especially um, with the amendment of audio and being a musician and bringing that into my installations and that sort of thing. Um, I completed the multimedia production program at Lethbridge College after um, high school. Um, high school is where I started to get into like Premiere and Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, but that uh, program in college really pushed my interest for a lot of other digital media and really expanded on my, my knowledge base. Um, moving forward into doing my Bachelor of Fine Arts, which was um, done at um, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops. I focused more on more traditional senses of art. That's where I started to get involved with sculpture and installation. And then within the six years that I moved um, back up to Yellowknife, um, I was introduced to virtual reality from um, Davis and Jeremy at uh, Western Arctic Moving Pictures. And they really like gave me the nudge to start working in uh, Tilt Brush. Um, so I picked that up and immediately just started to run with it, uh, being inspired by a lot of the Denny legends from the Northwest Territories. Um, and then that just kind of expanded on my, my thirst for different software like Adobe Medium and uh, Codon, Masterpiece VR. Um, and it got to a point where I wasn't even playing video games in VR anymore. I was using it more as like a, a development tool. Um, which I'm still doing and I, I really enjoy that. Um, and now taking these creations that I make in a virtual reality environment and bringing them into software like Blender um, to prepare them to be used in game engines like Unity and Unreal. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Awesome. Uh, I know that I'm just going to have 100 million questions, but Asha, would you like to talk a little bit about your intro into the media? Absolutely. Uh, I would say my introduction to interactive experiences starting with my first job in high school when I was 14 I was an, an exhibition explainer at the New York Hall of Science uh, where we learned how to uh, basically explain fancy science concepts in easy to in easy and accessible ways so from there eventually I ended up in graduate school where I was still interested in interaction and specifically using digital medium as a new interaction format so in graduate school, I focused in creating uh, shared VR, AR, and XR experiences, always asking the question, how can we connect in these digital experiences in social, collective, and multiplayer ways? So for my thesis in graduate school, uh, I created an, an XR experience that used data to ask the question, what does trust look like? And these same uh, themes, these same questions of digital experiences, connection, um, and trust, are still themes that carry forward into my work today. Uh, Moni? Yeah, so my introduction to, it was really to tech, technology was, um, it's a crazy story, but in the mid 1970s when I was a toddler, um, the only books we had in the house were computer programming books because I was surrounded by military communication specialists. So I'm all about communications, um, and, but I was also being forced, because my grandparents raised me to speak our language, but I was being forced to take French when I was a child. So it really, I am so driven. So everything I do with VR, AR, you name it, with the, the robots and the chatbots, it's always an excuse for me to support our language dialects in every way. So, so in 2010, um, fast forward 2010, I started, I got the first Oculus in the Kickstarter program. I was funding that because I wanted to build really cool stuff because I have been 
all my life I'm, I experiment. I'm a person that I'll take apart car motors, electricity in houses, the VR devices. So that's what got me started. And that's what keeps me going is just, I'm, I have this very strong drive to support our language dialects. My grandfather survived a residential school and front lines of war. So I'm definitely, um, nothing's gonna stop me from just using, who knows what I'll be using next to like support our languages. I don't even know. <laughs> That's all. You're going to have a lot of fun with one of my later questions. I was just going to cool. say, you're going to have a lot of fun with one of my later questions for sure. Cool. Santo, would you like to give us some of your thoughts? Yeah, totally. Um, so at first when I came into game, so originally the way that I came into it is um, I actually studied game animation at George Mann College in Toronto. Um, and prior to that, I was like mostly just thinking of like, I really like to draw, how can I somehow turn this into a career? Uh, so I was like, game animation seems cool. And then uh, going into it, I had no intention of like creating games at all. I was just going to you know learn game animation because it was unusual. And then once I was actually in there, I got into game making because of uh, an organization in Toronto that I now actually co-direct called Games Making Games. And they offered a lot of programs for uh, people that are interested in learning more about making games or any other format of like game making, like tabletop or like analog games. Uh, so I, by entering that space, I actually got to experiment in like game jams and to make games. And um, I also really like writing. So I kind of started playing with Twine and with my artwork. So I'm like, okay, cool, I can actually mesh all these aspects together and make something, you know, totally different and unique. Um, and from there, I just started to, you know, really just dive in and experiment more. Um, I release, you know, like little tiny games on like itch.io just to experiment with different stories and different methods of making games. And uh, most recently, I like fully now into like Unity and all those things. So I'm trying more complex things uh, with, uh, still using animation because that's still my background. So I like to play a lot with like 2D art, especially with what in the art, it's primarily like really 2D in its elements. So I really like to play around with that and see how I can change that within a game perspective. It sounds awesome. I'm like, I'm all like, okay, keep talking. The uh, Tally, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your intro into digital media? You know, it's the kind of thing where, uh sort of when I was about 20, um, I just finished my university degree and it was sort of the thing where I went through university and school mainly thinking that there was, you know, the design uh, language of how design is done. And, you know, you can see that very self-evidently with like, uh, for example, whenever you see sort of like an app how it's designed, it's very much got a language to it around the structure and things like that, you know, like having certain icon placement up here, even icons, you know, being the sort of homogenized design thing. And I think it was the kind of thing where, uh, when I was about 20, I got introduced to Uncle Norm Sheen, uh, or Radri Elder, and um, his whole thing was that he was actually one of the original uh, design students when design was becoming a, um, uh, I guess, officialized academic subject in universities, right? And the whole thing he sort of opened my eyes about was this idea that um, that's actually just one way of doing it. And indigenous design is actually pretty different. And he was able to sort of walk me through what he called respectful design, which was um, a design process that's uh, more based in sort of the agency of community and things like that, which, um, you know, if you say that to most sort of like mainstream or Western designers, they would just sort of raise their eyebrow, like, how does that even relate to design at all? But a lot of the design conventions, I think that are, I guess, Western design conventions aren't necessarily correct. Um, they're just a different way of doing it. And, um, you know, when I sort of say this idea that I want to sort of embed indigenous knowledge to the foundation of the designs I'm going to do in the future, I already kind of know how to do that because I've been taught by a really, really smart guy. Um, and I say that because sort of had a way of doing stuff that was um, non-prescriptive. Um, like he always talked about the idea that 
if students are going to university, we want to build people with agency, not dependency. So mm -hmm. people who can sort of go back to community and do great work without the need for, um, you know, someone to hold their hand through it. They'll know, you know, this is the way you talk to community or consult elders and things like that. Because I guess the reality is, you know, we're working in a university space and, um, you know, 95% of the people who come into an Indigenous knowledge degree are like white women and it's the kind of thing where I'm not going to throw any shade or anything, but there tends to be a stereotype of someone who goes through that. And sometimes they do cause more damage than was already there in community just because of certain assumptions and things like that. So being able to get people like that through the space that were, um, you know, able to sort of go back and, and do really good stuff, I think was, was a really challenging thing to do. But once, um, you know, we sort of, work through that it it was able to I, I think manifest manifest itself in the teaching itself because I, I think it all comes back to sort of like the ways of doing um when you're doing that stuff i've sort of leaned a little bit outside the question there but i i guess just to say that like my sort of introduction to the, i guess the design i'm doing now um it's it's uh based in this idea of respectful design which is an indigenous uh, design framework and uh i think it's the kind of thing that once you sort of um, understand things like that at a foundational level, it's impossible for it to not trickle into everything you do. Yeah. It's okay. I think we're just going to pick up that like train of thought and then move it into the next question. But I was like, oh, a buzzer. I was like, could I have that at faculty meetings where like academics are just like, you know, I was like, loop, loop. if I could just have that, that'd be such a great tool. Oh my God. I think I'm just like laughing at the possibilities of how much fun that would be at every meeting. Um, so the next question I have for you guys is, you know, how do you bring, and I would say that I know that your work brings in um, culture and practice and tradition. And so one of the questions is, you know, how, how are you doing those things consciously of bringing in culture and tradition into your theoretical frameworks? And then how is that affecting the things that you end up producing? Okay. So one of um, my overall themes for any sort of work that I do is this uh, kind of growth that happens between culture and technology. Um, for myself, I've relied on a lot of technology throughout my life to learn more about my culture. So I'm a firm believer that those two things have the ability to grow together as opposed to dividing them further apart. Um, and with within that it's it's always been this journey which will be a lifelong journey of like learning more about my culture or practices beliefs and language of course that's one of the biggest things um but uh in being motivated by you know the future sci-fi indigenous futurisms i i take what I know already and try and expand that and imagine it in a different space in a different world or what things could look like in the future because that's arguably one of the biggest sort of um, points behind indigenous futurisms is imagining ourselves in the future and what that could look like um, how our our practices and just knowledge base can evolve into something much more than what we have right now um, and in addition to what the animals that we rely on for, you know, our food and clothing, what those would kind of look like in the future. Um, so I've had a lot of fun um, really expanding on these like animistic properties of say things like the raven, caribou, moose, and, you know, creating them in this, in this really far-fetched sort of design realm. Um, but uh, I just find it so fun to be able to like imagine that and because it, it sort of raises awareness for you know our culture and the the longevity of these you know species and their lives and to want to have them in the future so it's kind of always marking that as an important sort of resource for us that we hope to experience for the rest of our lives and for the next generations to be able to experience as well i always get excited about what the next gen is going to do so i'm just like yeah it'll be very interesting Absolutely. So uh, one thing in my practice that I've been focusing on is, again, uh, virtual worlds, digital sovereignty, and uh, economic outcomes or quality. And so one of the recent pieces that I worked on is Fenote, which is an indigenous virtual town. 
And the special thing about this town, uh, Ganete is the Seneca word for town, and the difference in this is that it is something that's self-hosted. This town allows indigenous content creators to connect, share, and sell their goods. And part of this related directly to, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, everybody was stuck inside, right? There were no festivals, there were no powwows, there was nothing. And so I started thinking, what is another way that I can kind of help my community connect better? And that's where the inspiration for this project come from, came from. On the flip side, another inspiration was this, was, um, you know, in graduate school, I had started building all of these different interactable, virtual, shared experiences, right? But the more time that I was spending in these social VR worlds, um, some popular examples are Facebook Horizon or Microsoft Allspace VR. One of the things that I... Uh, major things that I noticed was missing was the virtual economies within these virtual worlds, right? When I was younger, playing different MMORPGs that were coming out at the time, such as uh, World of Warcraft or Maple Story, right? These virtual worlds had robust peer-to-peer -peer economies that where you could trade with the game and you could also trade with your peers. And so I think that there's, um, you know, games are always designed with intention. And so this is really the intention of uh, relating to some of the 2021 themes of South by Southwest here is what does it mean to build the future from scratch, uh, right? And the areas that I would like to go into eventually are, you know, what does it mean to challenge technology's path forward? What does it mean to do this with a new sense of urgency? How do you correlate this with the rebirth of business? And what are some of the possible future trends that can affect uh, us being Indigenous people? <laughs> it's all, they're all very, very good questions, and especially in our current climate. Um, Oni, do you want to talk a little bit? Um, so I've been in tech for over 30 years, and um, I reached an age that I never thought I would ever reach. So even that's wild to me. So what I've done, and the 30 years of my career is I've been known in the past as being really hyper and just building stuff as fast as I can and pushing back when people try to stop me from like even supporting my language. And so what I'm doing now, thank goodness, because I'm, I'll always be kind of immature. I know that, but I am maturing a little bit. I'm actually slowing down and I am, as far as culture comes in, even though they have no experience, like they did not grow up with machines and the internet like I did, I am bringing in elders that have no, um, they don't, a lot of them don't even have interest in tech. I'm bringing them in and they are having a, a lot more say in the work I do because um, something that really disturbs me about in the 90s, I was building Neha AI. And it was exactly what it sounds like as far as artificial intelligence goes, but over the years and with life experience, it's moved into ancient intelligence. And like, what does that mean? And that means having elders involved that have no interest in these machines, but also helping to uh, create like this strong foundation where I've stopped myself from racing forward to be the first to get everything in, the first of my name and for fame and whatever I was doing in my 20s, which was pretty crazy stuff. And now it's more important to me to just stop, slow down and make sure there's something in place. Like I've talked with Asha about it and I'm talking with other, uh, and I'm talking with elders about, about data sovereignty. Like I, I have the means, a lot of us, the younger people, we all have the means to throw out all our data, our language, our dialects, our culture, all this knowledge, Microsoft, like all these huge corporations are very hungry for it. They want it bad. And we can make some big money off that. However, it's like, we got to juggle. And I, I have gone through this, like in really awful, turbulent times where like, I really need money. This company wants all my data. I have like 60,000 language patterns of my dialects alone, plus other dialects where, because I used to pour over these old books with all the language info. And it's like when you're in that situation in life and you're alone and you don't, you're needing money and these big corporations are coming at you, you gotta make that decision. And thank goodness I have elders and mentors throughout my life that have helped me make really good decisions and consider, always consider future generations. How is that gonna impact them? If I have to be hungry for a week 
and not sell out everything for future generations, I can sleep better. So that's um, how I've been integrating the two is just always being conscious of what the legacy is of what I'm building and slowing down, even though I want to build some, there's some really cool stuff I want to throw out there with our language and especially in VR, I've been putting all my little chat bots in there that speak our language and they're really wild, but I'm like, I can't put it out there in a way that's going to not be just eaten up by corporations right now. So I got to do the other work. I think that answers the question. Oh yeah, no, hundred percent. I was like, I was like, you go. <laughs> and I think you're raising, like, we're going to also have a question a little bit about industry, but I think you're already flagging, you know, the different of the kind of cultural integrity that, um, you know, I would say indigenous and racialized people have to deal with in the kind of creation that, uh, you know, non, uh, non racialized folks or non indigenous folks don't have to to deal with. So I think that, you know, you're already flagging something we're going to talk some more about. But yeah, I'm excited to hear what others are going to say about that. But Tally, do you want to just add before we flip into a new into a new question? Uh, I'm just reminded Santo hasn't spoken yet. Um, would you like to go oh, first? Oh, sorry, just... Santo. I'm Cheers. sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, yeah, I think when it comes to like cultural integration into my work, um, I've definitely kind of experimented a lot with it and come at it like at different angles because a lot of my work is inspired by very personal family stories. Personal, not necessarily that they're... Um, not like easy to share or something like that but it's more personal in that they're very precious so i'm always very careful about like do i want to share this with the world do i want to actually put this in my work um and it's the, one of those things where like i i'm now at i'm at my point in a in my career where i can kind of already validate like okay yeah it's fine to do this and this and this but it there was so much process before that of me like evaluating like is it okay if i say this or this and obviously like I talked with my family a lot about it to see like is it okay if I you know share this story or is it okay if I tell it this way um just out of respect of like for the people who raised me and to know if like does it actually make sense does it actually translate does it uh, am I actually saying the same thing that was told through my uh, work um and one of the things that I really like doing a lot in all my games is also like um, echoing what was said before about animals, I like to use animals from South America that, um, especially a lot of the ones that grew, I grew up around and to use their symbology like in the games that I make. And one big one that I always use a lot is the jaguar because um, in what I need it's called the jaguarete and the word jaguar actually comes from that word. Uh, so I really like it as a symbol of like not just the name, but also what it stands for. Because the jaguar is an animal that traditionally it won't attack you unless you are aggressive towards it. So it's kind of like a metaphor that like, you know, it won't strike back at you unless you actually are aggressive towards it. And I think that actually speaks a lot about like also how I view a lot of things growing up in South America, like politically and historically. Um, and the jaguar, like it's the name itself, basically means like someone who kills you in one in one shot <laughs> so I like take really great inspiration around like just the history of that animal of the word and I like to tie it in to like very subtle ways into my work and um, also I'm also just really inspired by a lot of like newer media so uh, like anime or like video games so I also always struggle a lot with like can I appropriately like integrate the two without like it being anything that is like totally off from what I'm trying to say. So in experimenting with those new ones, especially like I grew up a lot of around a lot of my cousins and like uncles and stuff like that. And everyone really liked anime growing up. And it's really fun to see like a lot of people now actually dub anime in, like Guarani and put put it on YouTube for people to watch. So it's like experimenting with that kind of like playfulness of language, but also like in a very specifically like meaningful way sorry now tally would you like to <laughs> yeah no, that was, i really liked that story about the jaguar um i, I uh, was thinking a lot about that i mean um it seems like i'm always last in the circle here but i get to absorb everyone's thoughts and think about them a lot but um uh yeah i was just thinking about the idea of like you know 
uh, culture and practice. And like, I guess the big thing that I sort of think about is um, this idea of like culture hiding in plain sight or protecting itself. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing that's universal to pretty much everyone in this room is this idea that um, a lot has already been taken um, and putting it out there in sort of an open space like games or media or a film that can be consumed by anyone, there's that risk that it'll be taken again or, um, you know, used inappropriately. Uh, an example of that, I think, is uh, one of the, you know, apps I developed at the university was um, this language app, right? And the thing about it was, you know, you sit and talk with elders for long enough and you start to see what's going on or what had gone in community, gone on in community before. And the story I always got told was this idea that uh, in the 80s, there was a linguist who came through and promised to revitalize the language. And it was the kind of thing where, uh, you know, you talk to one elder and they talk about she was there for about six months and made a dictionary and then moved on and sold the dictionary back to community. And then you hear another story from an uncle there and he says, um, I was translating for one of my uncles and she stood up in the hall and said, that's not how you say it. Um, which is, you know, like that, that's, that's what's in that space and that hurts community. Um, that hurts people, you know, when that disrespect is shown. So, you know, obviously when people think that they've gotten a hold of, you know, indigenous or just any other culture and they think that then they can own it and, um, command how it's done. I think a recent example, uh, I had a talk with one of my friends who's um, Asian American and he said he was really uncomfortable when we were playing, uh, I, was, I was streaming a little bit of the new cyberpunk game. So when he said he was getting really uncomfortable that just about everything in the game was Kabuto this, Kitsune that, and just all these very surface level words that um, have been taken from Asian culture and appropriated into this thing. Um, I, I think the, the way we protect around that uh, because I don't want to sort of just be nihilistic about this stuff. I think the way we do protect around that is this idea that um, culture is very good at hiding itself or hiding in plain sight. Uh, with the Umarangi generation, the idea was that it's done in a layered approach. So the very entry layer to the game is that when players play it, they see a photography game that has a jet set style radio. And if anyone's ever played a video game and they've played a photography video game, they immediately think Pokemon Snap or, you know, there's not many photography games, right? And so that's the first layer. And then the second layer below that is a little bit deeper and it's the sort of critique of neoliberalism and the idea of, um, you know, wicked problems. The idea that the thing that creates the problem can't be the solution. And there's the sort of, let's just simulate what neoliberalism would be like if there was a, and I'm going to just spoil it for everyone here. Let's simulate what would happen in this current neoliberal space if like Godzilla or like a kaiju came in and started destroying stuff. The reality is, is that people would start to try and ignore that that's happening or they would try to incorporate that into mass media culture where, you know, it would be this thing that people would put, um, jellyfish over the, the, the kaiju in this game sort of looks like a blue bottle right and they would put um you know tentacles on things or they would start to make food that looks similar to it and there would be this thing where the government would try to shift the responsibility to where the idea would be that people were warned about this you know years in advance don't drill in the pacific you'll reawaken these things and the idea being that um there's this you know um, absence of responsibility and trying to shift the issue into something else. So there's that layer. The third layer in that game, which is where most of the Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous critique lies, is the deepest. And it's the one where you have to go through those other two first if you're non-Indigenous to see it, right? Indigenous players, when they play the game, they see the third layer immediately because it's self-evident, right? You know, we see a character in the very first level um, Maori person who's got, you know, huia feathers, but also a Captain Cook jacket, right? We understand what that is straight away. It's the idea that we have to, you know, be in these spaces and wear these kind of clothes, right? Um, wear these hats, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we see this idea that one of the levels is literally called invasion, right? Um, 
we can pick up on the stuff quite easily, but it's hidden layers into it that by the time that person walks to that space, it's much harder for them to steal it. And even if they were to try and steal it because of how the game's structured, the idea was, well, we are going to put some patterns in here, but they're very um, minor patterns that, you know, you can't necessarily um, take and use for certain things, right? We are going to put certain concepts in here, but are you going to pick up on them? Because they're not the ones you read in a high school social studies book. It's about lived experience, right? Um, you know, it's this idea that if we make this stuff and we make it in a way where it can't be taken easily, uh, I, I think it's going to protect itself. And so, you know, I kind of think about that, you know, I'm working on my next game at the moment, sort of in the pre-production phase and the idea around, um, once again, this idea of the foundational layer, um, it's this idea of instead of doing sort of the, uh, you know, I guess, Western design model of video games around um, randomness of random number generation, instead, we're not going to do that. We're going to do a pattern based approach that's based more on weaving, you know, Raranga, this idea that, you know, a simple turn can change the design entirely, right? And can we get the computer to sort of simulate this idea of a twist or a turn that creates you know what the game might see as randomness but the idea being that it's still a pattern and there's still a way that you can read the pattern from start to finish and you can still see that there's order to it it's not just a thing that's sort of left to the wind right um and so i think about like that kind of stuff when it comes to you know incorporating indigenous knowledge and um you know our ways of doing into design itself and i think uh it's one of those things where like I think with the games industry, there will eventually become this fetishization of indigenous culture that, um, you know, we've all sort of got to like prepare for now because uh, I think the reality is that, you know, once people start to see value in something, they do want to try and own it. Um, and if it's done in this way where we can uh, keep the keep it from being stolen, but still show the um, value of it, I think that's a really positive thing. And that leads us so nicely into our next question. So, you know, um, and you all have been touching on it a little bit, but uh, more directly, we're going to ask you, what has your experience been as an Indigenous person in your industry? And how are we challenging the status quo? Um, so overall, my experience within the industry has been has been quite positive, um, especially within, you know, the VR world and that sort of thing um when i was first getting into uh vr i think i i made about three or four um models in tilt brush and after that time i was invited down to vancouver by the im4 um, media lab to do a workshop on on tilt brush i'm thinking like i just started like what's what's going on here right so it was a really good opportunity. It was a really good jumping point. Um, that was actually the first time that I met uh, Moni as well. Um, they were there doing a, a workshop too. Really good opportunity. And then things just started to kind of like, you know, snowball from there. Um, a lot more opportunities started to pop up um, and avidly showing my work with, uh, with Imaginative. Um, they've been excellent to work with and um, other sort of opportunities like being commissioned to create uh, virtual reality creations for other organizations, uh, such as uh, USA, um, the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth, based out of um, Calgary, and uh, recently being involved with the Vancouver Mural Festival. Um, the only kind of mildly negative thing, I guess, is that because a lot of the digital and virtual reality work was getting a lot of attention, um, I felt I started to get a bit pigeonholed with with um, myself mm -hmm. as an artist. Like people would just assume that I'm a virtual reality artist um, when in reality, my heart and soul is within large scale installation work. Um, so what I have to remind people- You don't people have to convince me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Julie, I appreciate that. Um, so, I just have to like kind of remind people or whatever it's like you know i i do a lot of different things um and i find that that digital media and vr specifically is is now something that i've added to my you know 
for lack of a better term, arsenal of, of artistic um, abilities in order to communicate my ideas because some mediums can't really translate um, uh, your aesthetic or your concept as effectively as another medium could, right? Um, so I find it's, it's very valuable to have that experience. Um, but uh, I'm also just super grateful as to um, how welcoming the industry has been, um, especially within the Indigenous multimedia or Indigenous like gaming or VR industry. It's still a very small sort of group, right? And there's so much room for, for everyone and all different aesthetics and abilities and content creators and that sort of thing. And I've been really, I've been so glad that it's been such a healthy environment um, for myself, especially, but it just feels so welcoming. And it seems like, you know, we all get along quite well. Um, and there's just so much room for like collaboration and um, experimentation as well. Awesome. I think the new work for the for the Vancouver Mural Fest is awesome. So it's exciting, you know, as somebody who um, just organized a whole event that was all virtual. It's like it as much as you're saying it could get you pigeonholed. It's also really tough, I think, to get people's minds and have them have the ability to have the digital literacy to be able to engage with that medium as well. So it's interesting and, and it's it's great to hear what what you were saying. Um, Asha, would you like to? Um, absolutely. So a little bit about my uh, experiences and, and what opportunities I foresee coming forward. So my personal background, so I'm an enrolled member of the Seneca Nation of Indians, which is uh, an American Indian tribe, and it is also a sovereign nation, right? Within the United States, there are 573 sovereign nations distributed across, uh, across the U.S. And so in this sense, tribes in a way are a distributed autonomous organization. And so this is the question really that I'm facing now is how do you empower people that are decentralized, right? And how do you improve social and economic outcomes of community using technology? So this is a, uh, an idea and a theme that I started exploring with my previous work, Ganotier. Uh, which was the virtual world that was self-hosted. As a result of that, I was able to kind of create this infrastructure. And this is leading me into my next project that's coming up now, which is asking these questions, how do you empower somebody that's decentralized and how do you improve outcomes using tech? The answer that I think is one potential answer is with hyper-local distributed data centers. Right. The purpose of these is to one, help people own their own data so that we as indigenous people can have data sovereignty. Two, it'll allow people to earn income by offering and selling IT services to their community. Three, it also encourages resource allocation um, from hopefully to and to public utilities, such as internet access, electricity, and development of STEM skills. So this is just, uh, you know, if you're interested in more updates, you can follow my mailing list at SenecaInteractives.com. I would love to connect with you. Santo, do you want to take a, a, a shot at that? <laughs> yeah, I guess I was also in really deep thought about like my, like my trying to explain my experience without sounding, I guess, like too negative because there have been positive sides um, to my career, obviously, but um there have definitely been a lot of i've struggled a lot definitely with being i guess yeah like similar to to being like pigeonhole being like tokenized a lot because i am queer and trans alongside being you know racialized and being an immigrant and all these things so i tend to struggle a lot with basically being really careful about who i choose to work with and making sure that if i'm going to work with someone new that i you know ask around, ask other people what their experience was with that particular organization or person or group. Um, because in the past, I have definitely been burned a lot by different organizations that, you know, weren't indigenous run and were mostly people who wanted someone who could, you know, take off all the check boxes, right? Who was 
this, this, and this, and you know, suddenly I'm the most diverse person they've ever met. <laughs> um, so I'm always very like, I'm like, have a healthy degree of skepticism uh, in order to like protect myself. And, uh, and in that case, like, I also just have a really tight knit group of other indigenous artists who I like to fall back on a lot whenever I feel like uneasy about something or whenever we need to, you know, share something amongst ourselves in private to make sure that, you know, we're not being uh, taken advantage of, um, especially in the games industry, this happens a lot to marginalized people. Um, especially if you're someone who's looking, for example, for a publisher or something more commercialized, then that starts to get into very kind of like murky territory. Uh, especially when you have an indigenous story, like publishers will be, you know, incredibly into it because they want that novelty of being able to publish an indigenous game. But then you have to really be careful about, you know, are they really invested in you as a project and as a person and do they want to support you going forward? Or do they just want to kind of just add that to the portfolio and say, you know, hey, we published an indigenous person once and that's why we're good. <laughs> so I'm always really careful about, you know, what choices I make, but in the choices that I have made, I have been really happy with the people that I have chosen to collaborate with because I think that has resulted in like, really strong relationships and bonds that have lasted, you know, several years. Um, I've met new people that I, you know, consistently work with and on my projects that, you know, I love working with and I wouldn't, you know, have it any other way. Um, and in the experience that I've had in my career, I also like, you know, take that and learn it and, you know, also apply it to helping others who are new to these industries and to make sure that they also aren't taken advantage of, especially like being responsible for co-directing a nonprofit. It's kind of also my responsibility to look out for other people and making sure that, you know, they're not being exploited, especially in the games industry. You're raising some really good points and I'm sure Moni, you're going to have some, some additional things to add to that. I've been really lucky, but I'd say maybe in the most recent seven years, I've been able to be really picky with who I work with, finally, right? So I, pre everyone I work with is indigenous. But before that, what I did was I would just take these jobs and use that to fund my, my language stuff. Um, so yeah, I've seen some terrible things, but, uh, and I also mentor um, people that are new to the tech industry and the big fame corporations, like the big ones. So even that, like for me, I find now, like I don't get stressed out anymore because I'm not dealing with some of that stuff that we all know about with tech industry. It's called toxic for a reason. However, I'm getting the second and third hand stress because people I really love dearly and care about, they're like, I'm the safe shoulder for them to cry on. And I have, you know, all these, all that information that I will not share, but, um, that it still, it hurts me because I'm like, I see these beautiful people and all these in tech and art and you name it and artificial intelligence just um, being, yeah, hurt pretty badly. But for me um, right now, I'm later in my career, it's been really amazing because, and actually anyone who's like struggling in any of these industries, I always tell them, do what you can to get your own, your own, companies set up so that you can pick and choose who you work with, why you work with them, what you're working on. Um, and I know that sounds crazy to people who've never done that before, but it really is a huge life changer, especially when you're, so in my experience, I can't speak for anyone else. I'm in a situation where I look like a white lady. So people feel really comfortable when they interview me in these tech industries. Oh, this is, especially when I was younger, they're like, oh, this is one of the guys she loves, she'll love beer pong and all these perks that we have to, you know, which I can't stand any of that. Um, and then when they hire me, they find out, they do all that checks. They check off everything, female, uh, you know, indigenous and all these different things, neurodiverse. I have that challenge too. But once you start working with me, if you're not on the home way, um, it's very, they, people very quickly find out that I am not a good fit into that culture so you got to deal with that and then also help all your peers who are not a good fit um 
you know, and can say things that they don't like. So what I, I think it is the best of times and the worst of times. And I love that my community, Akwesasne, it's like this whole village helped to raise me. And they did teach me about, you know, whatever you go looking for, you're going to find it. So if you want to focus on all the horrible things and the horrible people that are going to abuse you and whatever, that's all you're going to see. And that's all you're going to experience no matter who you are. So you have to go looking for the, and not with rose colored glasses. Like you have to go looking for like, why are you doing what you do? And every, and, and a big one for me in all of these industries is because I see a lot of people suffering and in pain right now with this pandemic um, is I think the most important thing is no matter how mean or angry or cruel people get is to never dehumanize them. Always remember you're dealing with human beings and I think everything will work out. So that's my answer. I like it. <laughs> and it's true, you know, you're you're talking about, you know, the kind of balance that you have to figure out, right? And and that's hard. Tell you want to weigh in because you're on the other yep. side of the world. And so <laughs> you know, what sis was just saying there is like totally on the money, I think along like around a lot of it. Like one of the things um some of my uncle said to me was they'll say things around you they won't say around us. Right. Obviously, because I, I pass easily, right? Um and it's that idea that like, you know, it was the kind of thing where I could be in a, a fly on the wall in a room sometimes with a group of people and they would just openly say things that they didn't want other people to hear. And it would be the kind of thing where I could just like, just casually walk over to, you know, black followers in the room and be like, these guys want to fuck you over. Um, it goes both ways. I think like, you know, if, if your entire worldview is based on like racism, like I, I just to wind back a little bit here, Australia is a very like um, it's a very racist country in terms of like I think it was uh, Stano who said this idea that the often intense racism of Australia goes unnoticed, right? And it's this idea that um, you know summarize it. One, one of my aunties said this to me. She said, "Man, Australians have a fucking bad name for everyone, don't they? Like you know they've they've always got an insult for someone, but the moment you poke at them a bit, it's you know they get really upset about that, right?" But I, I think it's this idea that you know in Australia, if they see me, they think white straight away, right? And I think using that in when you're in a like sort of space like that, and then knowing that's an assumption that's going to be built into it, I think like you know it's it's sort of like something that you know people like me should probably use to an advantage there because I, I think there's um, you know this kind of idea that like if I can open a door because of that that lets you know other people through that have been pretty much just pushed down and and that's you know stopped from opening um you know i'll probably do that every time i think the other thing that comes with that is um sometimes being in these spaces the way to introduce like indigenous knowledge or indigenous ways of doing is that uh they often don't know much about us but we know a lot about them in terms of uh what they've done to our families and done to us over the years right and it's that whole idea that we can translate into their words pretty easily i think uh the idea i think around that is like you know uh, we were looking for some education funding once right and it was the kind of thing where one of my mates he uh, aboriginal fellow he happened to work as a teacher right and he did an education degree and he knew exactly the words they wanted to hear when talking about funding for indigenous events and stuff, right? Or uh, Aboriginal futures, right? And the idea around that was, he said, I know how to word this in a way where they'll think it's something, but we can still do the good stuff, right? Like the kind of things they want to hear is things like, um, for example, Aboriginal students enrolling into university, right? What we wanted to really run was for this idea of getting kids who the school had essentially abandoned them at that point and were always looking to ways to expel them, getting them out of that toxic situation and instead sitting them with elders and, you know, uh, say, for example, like cultural people. And in, instead of uh, that day being a day where they would get yelled at by a teacher and put on detention for doing nothing, right? They could come to the university um, learn how to say, you know, make a spear or something like that. And then after those 12 weeks, deliver a talk back to the school that 
explained everything about what they'd learned, right? And it was this way where it still fit and ticked all the boxes that this education funding was looking for, but it was radically different in the approach. And I think it's that whole thing where if you can find a good group like that, where you've got someone who has the expertise to know how to not break the rules, but twist them in a way where they still fit with what the government funding's asking for, but it's still done in a way that's, you know, productive to the community. Um, the thing I also think around that, I've just got uh, written down here because I was thinking a lot about stuff when all of you were talking, was sort of this idea that um, eventually you might get to a point where um, your stuff's like sought after or whatever, right? And you can translate it back into it. The thing I was just sort of thinking was like, um, at one point we were asked to sort of uh, remap a curriculum, right? And the curriculum was, um, if you've ever seen a curriculum document, it's dot point and dot point on key points and objectives, right? And the way we started to map it was visually with not with no words, right? Like, And it was this way of we we're doing it with pattern and stuff like that. And it turns out that when we started, you know, pointing at this thing that we were mapping, um, we stopped using English words because English words could only take you so far, right? They had a set of assumptions built into them that would only ever like be able to talk about the certain elements you're talking about to a certain extent. And it turns out that the way to talk about that word much better or more efficiently was to use, you know, indigenous language and stuff like that. And where I worked was obviously, you know, off my um, homelands and stuff like that. So it was a thing where I was taught certain words to be able to sort of relate back to this thing. And I guess once again, sort of going back to the very, like the last question from last round, it was sort of that idea that that in and of itself also protects the intellectual knowledge in that space, because if you're using language that is, uh, say for example, like Cherokee or something like that, um, Cherokee people will know that language inside and out and they'll know how to, you know, respectfully move through that space. And I think it's also that thing where, you know, it can sort of uh, mold itself around a situation. Um, and so it got to this point where uh, we were able to map this thing back to them, present it back to them, but translate it into English into the sense where we could say, okay, so this is your sort of foundational area and it might take us 20 minutes to explain the entire concept of just one part of the image, right? For us, it might take about five minutes, but for them, it, it would be this kind of thing where we could give them a white paper that goes through the kind of thing, right? And when that's done, I think it's this whole idea that it uh, tends to be something where like, you can sort of, I guess, bend the rules a little bit to sort of um, do the right thing. You know, if you say indigenous ways of doing and Western ways of doing are both equally valid and both um, as useful ways of understanding the world. Some people get incredibly unsettled by that because they've been told for their entire life that indigenous ways of doing is, you know, this, this construction that they've read in their textbooks where it's seen to be lesser or primitive or this, um, you know, thing. They never mentioned the fact that the reason it's portrayed like that is because of the violence of colonization where this stuff has been um, systematically, you know, ripped apart, you know, families torn apart, you know, elders forbidden from speaking the language and all this stuff. So sorry to completely go on a... <laughs> Uh, roundabout walk there but this whole thing is just that like I think um, when it comes to like a lot of this stuff like if we stay true to our sort of roots around a lot of these things I think like that's that's much better I think than trying to sort of like play the system uh, definitely over our time but I I want to say that the future if um, you know you guys are the future, and we have the next generation that's even you know gonna like knock our socks off, and I think that it's exciting to think about what the potential uh, opportunities are for us as we continue to kind of push um, media. And for me, I make the argument that I think that they're decolonial tools, and so that you know we've been able to manipulate those tools to be able to tell new narratives and new stories in new ways. And um, I'm really thankful. I want to say. Marcy, Chimagwich, um, to all your guys' time and energy to be here with us today. And I want to, of course, thank the audience that uh, isn't totally Zoom fatigued and tuned into this uh, talk.
and to encourage everybody to check out the Imagine Native uh, Festival this October. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a great time. <laughs>